Und Judith Schalanskis, or Judith Schalanskis Verzeichnis einiger Verluste came out in late 2018. The German critics responded with near unanimous amazement at the breadth and depth and linguistic virtuosity, the subtle, strong power of this book. Of course, at the time, no one could predict what unintended tragic resonance a book entitled An Inventory of Losses would acquire two years and so many losses later when the ever-adventurous Barbara Epler at New Directions published the English translation by Jackie Smith. And it is thanks to Jackie Smith that this English offspring not only renders all the breadth and depth and virtuosity of the original, it is also able to house this sadly enlarged reflection on impermanence, on transience, on passing. Take, for instance, these lines from the preface. Being alive means experiencing loss. The question of what the future holds is presumably nearly as old as the human race itself, given that one feature of the future, as inevitable as it is disquieting, is that it defies prediction and hence gives no clues as to the timing and circumstances of death. Despite the changes wrought by COVID-19, the English version also captures the celebratory enchantment of the original, as its 12 chapters skip across time and space from ancient Greece to present-day Germany, from an island that disappeared into the South Pacific all the way to the moon. Each of these episodes has its own distinct narration, and the resultant voices are every bit as wide-ranging as the tales they tell. And yet, despite this formidable diversity of subject and style, there is nothing sprawling or extraneous about Shalansky's highly disciplined prose. The very form of the book helps contain the ideas. Each of the chapters is of identical length separated by a page with a barely discernible image against a field of dark graphite gray. Judith Shalansky, incidentally, is also a designer of books. All a quite daunting job for the translator who must reassemble the original with verifiable accuracy or else risk results as far-fetched as the 17th century German scientist Otto von Goerdeke, who refashioned fossilized bones from a nearby cave into, a into the skeleton of a presumably no longer extant unicorn. But no unicorn traps for Jackie Smith, whose linguistic dexterity has clearly been honed by her work translating official documents where there is no room for imprecision and where there is seldom appreciation for the enormous effort such labors require. At the moment, I'm actually curious to know what boots she wore working on this book because she clearly had to traipse pretty deep into the linguistic brambles to uncover all the names for flora and fauna noted by Shalansky. Duckweed and sedge, elder and blackthorn, aconite and celandines, wagtails, skylarks, and yellowhammers. And as with the German, the accumulation of names goes beyond mere nomenclature to evoke a sense of wonder, of beholding, of beauty even in the midst of decay. Here from the chapter entitled Greifswald Harbor. At the edge of the city, the watercourse forks. I follow the most inconspicuous of its branches, the stream hidden deep in the scruffy field margin and lined with crack willow. The trees rise up out of the karstic brushwood like bulky beings moored upside down to the undercut riverbank, their crowns pollarded 
their branches stunted, hollowed out by wind and weather, rotting wood bulges from their burst insides. Several of the narratives come in the invoked or invented voice of the person most closely associated with the lost object. And here, Jackie Smith shows a great talent for mimicking the mimic. Greta Garbo's inner monologue as she roams Manhattan, or Armand Schultes riffing on the encyclopedia of human knowledge he displayed on tin plates in a grove of chestnut, tre of chestnut trees in the 1950s and 60s, or Gottfried Adolf Kinau, whose 19th century depictions of lunar topography were much admired before they disappeared, presumably during the Second World War. That chapter begins like this. Knowing when and under which constellations I was born does little to illuminate the subject of our investigation. Suffice it to mention that my entry into the earthly world fell on one of those annually recurring nights in which the Leonids reveal themselves in one of the most impressive celestial light spectacles visible to the naked eye, at least back in the days when the blackness of the night had not yet been diluted to a perpetual twilight by the glare of gas lamps and their inglorious successors. The chapters range from epic scope to myopic focus, and the variety of voice is reinforced by shifts in tense and rhythm, all carefully captured by Jackie Smith. A bell rings, a gate opens, the crowd yells, a man enters the arena, a bestiarius, wearing nothing more than a tunic. For that chapter, we are in Rome, where Emperor Claudius looks on as a now extinct Caspian tigress defends herself. That some of the passages refer to lost writings is hardly surprising given the nature of the book itself and books in general as both an acknowledgement of and an antidote to our own impermanence. Here is a passage from the chapter on the lost love songs of Sappho. These songs have fallen silent, turned to writing, Greek characters borrowed from the Phoenician, dark magic schools carved into clay earthenware in a clumsy schoolboy hand or copied onto the pith of the woody wetland grass by a diligent professional using a reed pen, and delicate minuscules written on the pumice-smoothed, chalk-bleached skins of young sheep and stillborn goats, papyrus and parchment, organic materials which once exposed to the elements, eventually decompose like any cadaver. Along with the book's meta-meditations on writing come the author's musings on her own past, memories of growing up in the now extinct German Democratic Republic, of playing in a village cemetery. I ducked down run my fingers over the smooth stone, feel the rough indentations of the chiseled letters and wait for the improbable. I wait to be found. I want to be found. I'm afraid of it. I hope that these passages I've been citing give at least a hint of how well the translation conveys the musicality of the original text, the careful attention to melodic line and rhythmic structure, the range of dynamics from animato to doloroso, all within a plangent minor key so evocative of yearning and so inviting to reflection. In recent years, many metaphors have been called upon to characterize the art and craft of translation. Here, that of conductor may come closest to describing what Jackie Smith has achieved, setting the tempo, shaping the sound, and integrating the various sections to transmit a unified work originally composed in another language. My suspicion is that she is a musician herself, 
a suspicion bolstered by a curious line I read on the CV I requested, which mentions rock music gigs as an area of interest. <laughs> Before closing, I'd like to take a moment on behalf of the jury to recognize the other translators whose works we had the pleasure of reading, and in particular, those we chose to include on our short list. Jefferson Chase for his compellingly clear rendering of Volker Ulrich's mammoth Hitler biography, Tess Lewis for her subtly sly and appropriately arch version of Jonas Lüscher's Kraft, and Imogen Taylor for her impressive cross-cultural negotiation translating Sasha Mariana Salzmann's Beside Myself. Congratulations to them and to their publishers, thanks to whom this particular species of wolf is far from extinction. Finally, I'd like to celebrate the prize itself, and as we hear now observing its 25th anniversary, our jury's chair, Shelley Frisch, put it best when she wrote, the field of translation has been blossoming in recent years with new translation studies degrees, certificate programs, and increased translator visibility as evidenced by translators' names appearing on book covers and in promotional materials and book reviews, and by translators participating more actively in book launches and panel discussions. Helen and Kurt Wolf, who did so much to awaken interest in and nurture foreign literature in the United States, would have been pleased by these developments and this translator's prize established in their names and administered by the Goethe Institute has done a great service in bringing together the translation community, spreading the word about outstanding works in German and shining a light on translation and translators. And with that, we'll shine the light all the way across the Atlantic and welcome Jackie Smith. Thank you. <laughs>